I love this. I, I love humor. Uh, raising children and being in the probation office, you either laughed or had the spirit of murder, so I decided uh, <laughs> to learn how to laugh my way through, and I love this. Great truths that little children have learned. Number one, no matter how hard you try, you cannot baptize a cat. Number two, when your mother is mad at your dad, don't let her brush your hair. Number three, if your sister hits you, don't hit her back. The second person always gets caught. Number four, never ask your three-year-old brother to hold a tomato. Number five, you cannot trust a dog with your food. Number six, don't sneeze when someone is cutting your hair. Number seven, never hold a dustbuster and a cat at the same time. Number eight, you cannot hide a piece of broccoli in a glass of milk. Number nine, don't wear polka dot underwear under white shorts. Number ten, the best place to be when your mom and dad are mad at you is in your grandpa's lap. Great truths that adults have learned. Number one, raising teenagers is like nailing jello to a tree. Number two, wrinkles really don't hurt. Number three, families are like fudge, mostly sweet but a few nuts thrown in. Number four, today's mighty oak was just yesterday's nut that held its ground. Number five, laughing is good exercise. It's like jogging on the inside. Number six, middle age is when you choose your cereal for the fiber and not for the toy. Great truths you learn about getting old. Number one, growing up is mandatory, but growing old is optional. Number two, forget the health food. I need all the preservatives I can get. Number three, when you fall down, you wonder, what else can I do while I'm down here? Number four, you're getting old when you get the same sensation from a rocking chair you used to get from a roller coaster. Number five, it's frustrating when you know all the answers, but no one's asking you the questions. Number six, time is a great healer, but a lousy beautician. Number seven, wisdom comes with age, but sometimes age comes by itself. Four stages of life. Number one, you believe in Santa Claus. Number two, you do not believe in Santa Claus. Number three, you are Santa Claus. <laughs> Number four, you look like Santa Claus. <laughs> success. At age four, success is I didn't wet my pants. At age 12, I have friends. At age 16, I have a driver's license. At age 35, I have money. At age 50, I still have money. At age 70, I still have my driver's license. At age 75, I still have friends. At age 80, I didn't wet my pants. <laughs> I love that. Uh, you have to be old to understand that last one. Um, if you have your Bibles tonight, I just want to spend a few moments with you uh, declaring the birth of Jesus and what really happened and why we have a season to celebrate and why it's so important for women to yield to the emotions that God has given us. It takes motions to be a worshiper. And many times we have people sitting in church that cannot worship God because they have expended all their emotions before they got to church and there's nothing left for them to respond by. But we are incredibly creatures made by God that God has given us this incredible ability to be emotional and to be sensitive so that we can express that in every aspect of our life, not only in our aspect with relationships with one another and with our husband and our children and in our singleness. I, I have become more sensitive to single people within the church since I have become a widow. My husband passed away. And uh, I had to confess to God, it is amazing that you look at the church in the eyes of where you are, married and with children, but when you are by yourself, you realize that the body of Christ institutes a lot of people, not only those that are married and have children, but those that are single, and the widows and the widowers that are in our church that desperately need someone to reach out to them emotionally. Uh, I have great memories. I, I am so grateful that I'm so happy tonight that God loves sex. I, I'm, go I'm going to shock you tonight because I want you to know that God loves sex and everyone who's married ought to love sex. The only time sex is not good is when it's out of the boundaries of covenant because God created sex. And so I'm allowed to have memories. I just can't participate in anything anymore. And in the midst of it, we have incredible emotions that we stir up in our memory bank, those emotions that bring those wonderful thoughts of 
being sexually involved with the husband or falling in love and getting ready to get married or those emotions that cause us sometimes to have bad memories and those emotions that stir up in our memory bank hurt and pain. And God has given us that incredible thing. As we look in the book of Luke tonight, it is an incredible story to me because I believe everything that God records in his word is incredible because it is God talking and inspiring men through their emotions and their mind to record what they believe God is saying. So I believe the book is alive, and as long as it's just a Bible in my hands, I have not reached the depths of it. It's when it becomes a voice from heaven that I hold in my hand, and it begins to speak to me and encourage me and edify me and challenge me and change me that I become better off believing that God's Word is true and that it is alive. That is why we desperately need to be filled with the Holy Spirit tonight, ladies, and not just speak in tongues, but to be filled with the Holy Spirit where our tongue talking is an overflow because of the Holy Spirit's involvement in our life because he's the one that breathes on the book and makes it alive. And that's why I've got to pray in tongues every day because when I pray in tongues, the Holy Spirit begins to make this book alive to me. And it's when it becomes alive that he writes it upon the tablets of my heart and I become a living epistle. And that's the challenge that I become a walking book that someone can open my life and read about God's involvement and how he can change things. In the book of Luke, I love it because Dr. Luke was intelligent. Isn't it amazing? The 12 disciples, I would have never called them. That's why I know I'm not God. Because uh, 10 of them was a mess, and only two of them seemed to have some form of education. The rest of them were always messing up in their life, and yet God called them. And uh, I guess I'm happy tonight to know that God can call mess-ups just turn around to someone and say, that's why you're sitting here tonight. Hallelujah. <laughs> and so I, I am so grateful because one of the disciples' names was J James the Lesser, and I want to know less of what. Uh, you know, when he showed up at the prayer meeting, everything declined. You know, he was just <laughs> James the Lesser. And, and uh, James and John, uh, they were sons of Zebedee and the word literally when you break down means they had an uncontrollable temper and when they showed up they could not have controlled their emotions they were sons of thunder that just had an opinion whether it was right or wrong and Peter just you know about Peter and and uh, as he followed God as one of the disciples and Judas was a disciple who betrayed Christ I, I just love it that God even puts up with betrayals and gives them a chance to repent because when Jesus looked at him at the Last Supper and began to declare, there is one among you, and then looked at Judas and said, go do what you have to do. He was giving him that incredible opportunity at the last moment to change his mind because whenever Jesus is present, he will always give you that window to change your mind. Aren't you glad for that? That you can change when he is present. It's when he's not present that there is no opportunity to change, but when he shows up, he can give us those incredible opportunities opportunities to change our life and I just love it when I'm disciples. Dr. Luke was very educated and Luke was one of those men that we know very little about but he did record the book of Luke. He was one that literally intensely looked at things in a different way through the eyes of a physician and so we see a lot recorded in that book as Luke is inspired by the Holy Spirit to write down little facts that other disciples did not seem were very important. I, I love it that God can use intellectual people to write down little facts that don't seem important to me, but when I go back and read them where they're recorded, they are. And in the second chapter of the book of Luke, it said, now in those days there came a decree from Caesar Augusta that a census should be taken throughout all the inhabitants of the earth. And everyone was to register and Joseph went up from Galilee because he was from the city of Nazareth and the city of David. And in order to register, he brought along with him his wife Mary, and he was engaged to her, but she was heavy with child. Isn't it amazing that God will call you to the front and center when you feel like this is not the time I want anybody to be observing me? I want you to know heavy with child means nine months pregnant. That, that means you couldn't hide it. 
you couldn't lie about it. There is, a, there is something in front of you that is obvious that you have been up to something. And Joseph had to bring Mary. I love this man, Joseph, because we know very little about him. It's amazing on the day when we appear before the Lord, the people that we thought were nobodies, how God is going to give an account, how important they were to put things together to glorify God. The Bible says that Joseph was a righteous and devout man. And he had a visitation from an angel that his wife was going to become impregnant that he was engaged to and that he would have no part of it. In the natural mind, it was hard to understand that someone could be overshadowed by the Holy Ghost and did not need the involvement of a man. And yet Joseph trusted God. And on that day when he went into the city of David, he took Mary, who was also from the city of David, and they went to register. And Joseph bore the reproach and the shame and the gossip and the talk of every family member that was going to show up. It was like a family reunion when the census was taken. People that had moved off had to come back to their birthplace. And now he is pulling this woman on a donkey that is nine months pregnant. And the talk of the family is going like this because they are wondering, I never thought Joseph would do anything. Can I tell you, number one, you will never give Jesus room to be born until you're willing to re, uh, have the reproach of your reputation at, at, at the forefront. Joseph literally said, I don't care about my reputation and I don't care about what people are saying. I only care to be faithful to what God has entrusted me with. That, that is such an incredible thing for us women today that we make room for Christ to be born in our situation and in our life and that we bear the reproach and the gossip and the misunderstanding. To me, Joseph was an incredible man that could bear all of that in his own city. And he came along with Mary that he was engaged to that was with child. And while they were there, the days were completed that she would give birth. Isn't it amazing that God will orchestrate you to give birth when it's not really the place that you had picked out? I, I just love this God because uh, I'm sure Mary said, get me out of town. Everyone is talking. Everyone's looking at me. I, I want to give birth to Jesus somewhere other than here. And she gave birth, and while they were there... Uh, she wrapped him in clothes and laid him in a manger, and there was no room for him in the inn. I love this Joseph trying to find a hotel to put Mary in. At least it could be respectable. How many of you know that most of the time when we get impregnated with the Holy Spirit, we're willing to give birth to the kingdom of God? Just keep my reputation intact. Come on, let it be somehow respectable. How many of you know God laughs in heaven, and what he's laughing about is you and I? Okay, come on, because he's looking down saying there's no way you can give birth to the kingdom of God and keep your reputation and be respectable. And so in the midst of it, there was no room. I, I honestly say you're not good and anointed until somebody is lying about you. Okay, come on, that's how come I feel so anointed tonight, hallelujah. And I seem to get in trouble and keep my anointing. In the midst of it, Mary did not find room in the end. Because God made her go back to a stable. I, I was in Jerusalem years ago. Uh, I've had the blessed opportunity of going on many occasions. And this particular occasion, I was with a teaching tour and was part of it. And we actually went back into the deep, deep part of Bethlehem. And we went back to what was called the poor section of Bethlehem. And as they began to explain to us, it was probably most likely what it looked like when Jesus was born. Because the manger was not a barn, the stable was not a barn, as we have Texas mentality separated from the house. But the poor people had their stable on the bottom level and their house was on the top. And they would put all their livestock in there, and there was two reasons for it. They could watch over them where they would not be stolen, but also the body heat of the animals would go up and penetrate through the floor and help keep the house warm. So when we say that Jesus was born in a stable, what we must understand is you will never give birth to him if he isn't attached to some house. Come on, he has to be attached to the house. You, you can't have Jesus in church. Can I talk to you? As long as Jesus is in this building right here and he's not attached to your house, you hadn't given birth. 
talk about he has to be attached to the house. And it made all the sense when Luke began to describe that he was born in a stable and they laid him in a manger because he was attached to a house. And every time they would come down from their house, you had to pass through the stable to make sure that you understood you can't detach yourself from the birthplace of Jesus Christ. And so in the midst of it, she gave birth to him and wrapped him in swaddling clothes. And the recording of Luke said that she laid him in a manger. There are several things that I want us to see because all of a sudden in the same region, God began to speak to shepherds that were watching their flock by night. I love this. When it's the darkest time, you can have a heavenly visitation. Come on, how many of you know that most of us listen to the lies of the devil when it really gets dark and we think nothing in heaven could open to us. But the shepherds were watching their flock by night when all of a sudden angels appeared and the glory of the Lord shone round about them and they were afraid. And the angel said to them, be not afraid. I love this because I understand when you really have a visitation from heaven, you won't act charismatic. Can, can I talk to you? Because most of us think if we had a visitation from an angel tonight, we'd be shouting glory, hallelujah, and swinging from these rafters or at least one of these white, beautiful things that are hanging down. But I want you to know any time God's visitation showed up, fear gripped them. And the first thing out of an angel's mouth was, don't be afraid. I, I love that because I said I've never had a visitation from an angel because they probably wouldn't have to say to me, do not be afraid. I would pass out. <laughs> and, and they would say, be revived in Jesus' name. But the angel said to them, be not afraid. And, and as we look at that verse, it's incredible because the angel said to them in verse 10, don't be afraid for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will, which will be for all people. For today in the city of David, there has been born to you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. I want you to see that the declaration from heaven was he will not only come to save, he has come to declare his lordship. How many of you know when you get saved, he ought to become Lord? Come on, and someone that is Lord in your life has a right to say to you what you can and cannot do. So in the midst of it, the declaration from heaven was that he was a Savior and he was a Lord. This shall be a sign to you. You'll find a baby wrapped in clothes, laying in the manger, and suddenly there appeared with the angels a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men from which he is pleased. And when the angels had gone away into heaven, the shepherds began to say, Let's go and see this thing. And so they came and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. Can I tell you that what you hear from God, you ought to see from God. Come on, because hearing is not enough. Can I talk to you tonight? Because hearing ought to position you and I for revelation. The shepherd said it's not enough to just declare that we saw angels and that we heard something from the mouth of the angels. God wants us to see clearly what he was talking about. And I think one of the power powerful things of the Holy Spirit tonight in your life and my life is for him to fill me enough that I can see what's going on with what he says. Can, can you hear me tonight? Because see, you ought to have the scales removed from your eyes so that you can see this Lord, not just hear from this Lord. What's the importance of seeing it? Because you will fall for a counterfeit if you have never beheld the real thing. Come on, because... A counterfeit is a duplicate of the real thing. Come on. But there is a little bit of variety that changes. When you go into a bank and you are being taught to handle money, they will never give you the counterfeit money. They make you count real money over and over again to see how it feels. And they'll even make you smell it at times so that you know the smell and the feel of that. So when you're counting out and your fingers hit a counterfeit, it just don't feel right. And so now we are looking at the shepherds that are going to seal the real thing because it's not just what he said, it is what they are going to see. I am grateful to God for my Baptist background. Um, I am grateful that God filled me with the Holy Spirit. I am grateful that I, I have advanced in the kingdom of God and you have advanced in the kingdom of God. Many of us are not in the denomination that we got saved, but aren't you glad that there was a denomination that knew at least we had to be born again? 
Come on, because I was listening to one of the growing churches in the United States right now where one of the leading ministers of the fastest growing church said, you can find God anywhere that you look for him. There could be a higher power or another means. And I'm thinking, you need an encounter with an almighty God because there's only one way to be saved. Come on, through the blood of Jesus Christ. There is no other way. And I don't care if you are the fastest growing church and you are packing people by the thousands I, I, I don't care because you can't get to heaven unless you are born again. In the midst of it, now we are looking at the angels coming and the shepherds coming and seeing this incredible sign because their eyes will behold it. And the Bible said that when they came, there was Mary and Joseph and the baby. And when they had seen this and it had been known, the statement that had been told to them about this child and all who heard it wondered at the things which were told by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds went back glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen just as they had been told. I want to tell you not give glory to God until you hear and see. Come on, there's just something about hearing and seeing that makes you glorify and praise God. And it was exactly as God said it would be. And so tonight we had this incredible encounter of the Christmas season that we're looking at. And in the midst of it, many people will celebrate it in different ways and express it in different ways. But we as born-again Christians ought to be glorifying and praising God because we heard something and we saw something. And I never will forget when the Holy Ghost came to me and revealed Christ about 3.30 in the morning as I was down on my knees in prayer and heaven opened up and filled my living room and I was afraid and fell down on my face. But I'll tell you what, that was years ago and I didn't close my eyes and the same encounter is as real to me right now as it was then. Why? Because when God opens heaven by revelation, he will envelop it on the tablets of your heart and hell can't steal it. Come on, I want to talk to us because we as women need to open our emotions to glorify and praise God and believe God to hear something and see something by the Spirit of the Lord. I, I love it because they went back praising and glorifying God about what they had seen and heard. Can I tell you that you really and I really haven't had an encounter with God until we want to go back and tell somebody else. Come on, because as long as we're not telling someone else, we still have a religious spirit. Come on, how many of you know the hardest demon to run out of Dodge is a religious spirit? Come on, he just don't want to leave. Come come on, because we've made him so comfortable. Come on, we've lived with him so long. We've been in agreement with him so long. I am still fighting religious spirits, and I've been out of the religious uh, tradition for a number of years, but I found out full gospel, charismatic, tongue-talking, people have their own denomination come on and so in the midst of it now I got to be free from you guys come on I had to be oh, come on I have to be free from Baptist now I'm fighting Pentecostal tongue speaking people because we get in a, we get in a mode where it's more of a, a ritual to us than an encounter with Almighty God and I struggle with that all the time uh, my prayer life becoming a ritual reading the word becoming a ritual knowing that's what I'm supposed to do rather than love what I'm doing so in the midst of it the shepherds went back declaring what they had seen and what they had heard and on the eighth day they brought Jesus that had been conceived in the womb to be circumcised and when the days of their purification according to the law of Moses was completed they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord as it is written in the law every firstborn male that opens a womb shall be called holy to the Lord. I underline that because when you have a son that isn't acting holy, if he was the first one out of your womb, he does not have a chance. <laughs> oh, oh, come, come on. I, I believe that. I underline that, put it in highlight and put my son's name out by it and said, do whatever you want to do, but you are holy. And so in the midst of it, it said every male that came out of the womb was called holy. And they offered a sacrifice 
according to the law, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and divine, looking for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he saw the Lord Christ. And he came in the Spirit that day into the temple. And when the parents brought the child Jesus to carry out the custom of the law, he took him in his arms and blessed God and said, Now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all your people, a light of revelation of among the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And his father and mother were amazed at the things that they heard him say about him. And Simeon blessed him and said to Mary his mother, Behold the child's appointed for the fall and the rise of many in Israel and for a sign to be opposed. And a sword will pierce even your soul to the ends and the thoughts that many hearts will be revealed. And there was a prophet Annas that was there and she was advanced in years. She was a widow and she did not go out of the temple. She lived there day and night, and she fasted and prayed, and she was advanced in age. She was, she was in her 70s, and at the moment she saw Jesus, she began to thank him and continued to speak of him and look up to him, for she saw the redemption of, his, of Jerusalem. There are several things that I want to say to you and I as women tonight because we are incredibly separated by God tonight. We are incredibly emotionally created by God. I, I love it because I deal with so many men. I, I serve on several church boards and I sit with men all day long in board meetings and, and, and as I am sitting there I understand that men are very logical. They have all these little cubby holes and if they do not have a cubby hole to put it in, we will sit in the board me meeting until we can build the cubby hole to put it in. <laughs> I have one big cubby hole and I say glory to God and stuff it all in there. Because us women are that way, we just stuff it and say, one day it'll all work out. So in the midst of it, uh, I, I find myself very entertained at board meetings between logical and emotional. In the midst of it, there are several things that I want you and I to see as this story becomes alive to us. It is not just written on the pages so that we can say Luke recorded something in the Bible and we believe the Bible is true. It is put there for our instruction, our encouragement, our admonishment that it challenges us and changes us and confirms that God was involved in the birth of Jesus. Not only did he overshadow Mary, but that incredible encounter that she had was the revelation you cannot have men impregnate you. Can, can I talk to you? Because we need the power of the Holy Spirit. God uses men to give us revelation and men can preach to us and instruct us, but they cannot impregnate us. Come on, that is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And no matter what we hear in this service, if we do not take it home with us and get down on our knees and pray about it, we will never be impregnated. We will just have more information. And can I say to you and I tonight, hell is not afraid of our information. Hell was not defeated by religious information. Hell was defeated when the revelation of him showed up. Come on, when the revelated Christ shows up in your life, you become a threat to hell. And in the midst of it, Mary is going to be overshadowed. Can you imagine a 16-year-old girl that knew she was pure in her body, had never had sex with a man, suddenly feels something moving inside of her belly and growing because it took faith for her to say, God, I do not understand, but I believe. Because Mary said to the angel, let it be done according to thy word. And in the midst of it, according to God's word, we have to believe that we can be impregnated as women. And, and as we look at it, Joseph literally had to be impregnated with the understanding that I don't understand it, but if God said it, that settles it. How, how many of you understand? I, I mean, I understand. I've lived long enough to understand this truth. There are some things God is not going to let me figure out because I will never <laughs> trust him if I figure everything out. How, how many of you know sometimes you just have to follow him when you don't know what in the oomph is going on? Okay, come on, because God will make sure 
that the vision is bigger than you. Why? Because it has to be bigger than you. Then you cannot boast that you did it. Come on. If the vision was in your capability, God would never be glorified. God gets us to get married. Don't you just love it? We go down to the altar and we say, I do, and every one of us are liars. Come on. We have no idea what we're I doing to. Come on. And how many of you know, once you move in, you find out, I do did not mean what you thought it meant. And in the midst of it, it becomes bigger than us because we have to get God involved in our marriage because we find out, thou shalt not kill. <laughs> Come on. We find those incredible revelations like, I am not your mother. I can send you to the moon. In the midst of it, God always puts us in a place where we need God. We have children, and we say, oh, aren't they sweet, and this is a gift from God, and I'm so blessed. But they grow up. <laughs> Come on, and all of a sudden, we, we look at them and wonder, what happened to you? There's a transformation. You have lost your brain. Come on, hormones have taken you over. Come on, and in the midst of it, it becomes bigger than us for God's involvement. Mary carrying this thing was bigger than her because you can't understand how did it happen. How could I become impregnated? And when we receive the Holy Ghost, it's so God can impregnate us so that we look down and as he stretches us and we grow and even our appetite for God changes and everything. Mood swings where we love him one minute and we're too busy the next. And all of those things that happen when we are pregnant in the spirit, God makes sure you need me to make you understand what's happening. And in the midst of it, you cannot give birth without pain. I, I don't care how much you are filled with faith. When that head begins to appear, you're going to spell pain with capital letters. Come on, you can't give birth without pain. And yet we want to believe in Jesus' name, we're not going to have any pain. Jesus bore it all. We're not going to be rejected. Nobody's going to have misunderstanding. How many of you know, live long enough and God will make sure you're found out a liar. Come on, because there's pain involved in giving birth. I remember my brother, he's six foot five, isn't he? Six five. Uh, I had to ask my son how big he was, six five, and, and he and his wife were all involved in Mazda classes. And he informed me that his wife would have no pain at the at the birth, uh, La Maz. I mean, <laughs> maybe they should have been at Mazda, <laughs> buying a car. But, and the Lamaz classes. And he informed me, my wife is not going to have any pain. And I just laughed at him and said, you'll find out. And so they got their focus point. They teach you focus and how to breathe. And poof, 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 as, you, as you look at that focus, it's amazing when pain comes, how you can lose your focus. <laughs> it, it is amazing. I, I, I'm fighting right now to keep my focus from pain. But in the midst of it, they went to the hospital. My brother called and said, you know, the baby's on the way. So I said, okay, I'm on my way down there. So I got in my car and I drove down to the hospital and, and I went in and, and I said to my brother, can I pray for her? And he said, I guess it won't hurt her. Uh, my brother's uh, involved in the first Baptist church, not just the Baptist, the first Baptist. And so he thinks I'm a little strange and he's praying I get straightened up and I'm praying he gets messed up. But anyway, uh, I, I prayed for my sister-in-law and my brother. You know, they eat health food and all these little herbs. They grow in baby jars and all of that stuff. They were really into it, you know. And then so uh, anyway, um, they went in and my, my brother went in. And, and so in a few minutes, my brother came out and he looked terrible. I mean, I looked at him. He was as pale as a sheet. And and they had him in a wheelchair. And I'm looking at him thinking, what in the world? And, and, and you know, my focus wasn't on my sister-in-law. She's laying on the gurney. And I'm looking at my brother, and I'm saying, are you okay? And the nurse said, he is now. He passed out. I mean, he, he, he didn't know whether there was pain or there wasn't pain. He missed the whole event. And, uh, and um, in the midst of it, we are looking at pain involved. Because, listen, to be misunderstood is pain. Come on, for family members not to understand where you are is pain. To be rejected is pain. For you not to be able to explain what's going on in your life and not being able to communicate it to other people is painful. And there is a certain amount of pain that Mary is feeling. 
In fact, Simeon comes along and prophesies that the sword that is going to be pierced through him will pierce your own heart because he wanted her to understand that when you're connected and gave birth to something, you're not separated from what a person has to go through. You'll feel it too. Why? Because women have emotions and have feelings. And we know that when our children go through something, how it gives us pain. And we look at it and think, I wish you wouldn't go through that or I wish you wouldn't have to suffer that because there's a pain involved. There are several things that I want us to look at as women tonight as God has drawn us together as a great company of women. I love it because God prophesied in his word that a great company of women would come together to prophesy. And prophesy literally means to open up your mouth and talk to people about what heaven has told you. Come on, that, that's what the spirit of prophecy is about. Sometimes it's the gift of prophecy, but I'm here to tell you there is something greater than the gift of prophecy, the spirit of prophecy, where you just are overtaken and heaven is spoken to you. In the midst of it, there are several things that I want you to see because Jesus is going to be eight days going to present him to the Lord. Whatever you give birth to, you have to give it back to God. And in the midst of it, they bring this gift from God and present him to the Lord. He's eight days old, and they're going to circumcise him. In the midst of it, I want us to see that circumcision is very painful. I remember when my firstborn, and I wouldn't embarrass him tonight, but uh, I will too. But anyway, <laughs> I remember when the doctor came to me and said, your son has to be circumcised. I said, well, is it going to hurt him? He said, absolutely. I said, well, I'm not signing the paper." Well, when his father came in, I said, they want to circumcise our son, and it's going to hurt, so I didn't sign the paper. And my husband looked at me and said, sign that paper. I said, well, it's going to hurt him. He said, you are a woman. I am a man. Sign the paper. I did not have revelation because revelation was this, what you don't cut away. And if you look biologically at a male child, they have what is called the foreskin, and it serves no purpose at all. I mean, physically, it serves no purpose. They don't even know why it's there because they don't understand. God put it there to mark what belonged to him, and you had to cut it away. And if you don't cut it away, when you are young, it doesn't bother you, but as you grow older, it becomes a source of irritation and infection and germs and diseases. And Jesus comes along and said, you don't understand. I've got to mark you. I'm not going to circumcise you on the outside, but I'm going to come to your heart. And what you don't let me cut away and circumcise in your heart will irritate you the older you get. It will breed germs and infection and disease and irritation because what really belongs to me will let me cut it away and mark it so that hell will know when he looks at the heart, excuse me, this belongs to me. Amen. Come on, and that's what we can declare tonight, that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. Why? Because no matter what is in our heart that is not right, God has the ability to be the great surgeon. Come on, and cut that thing away. And I love it, whatever he cuts, he'll heal. Come on, whatever he cuts, he'll heal. I'm so glad I got scar tissue all around my heart. Come on, I am healed, but the scar is there to remind me, God, cut it away. Don't be stupid and get it back. Amen. Come on, come on to be marked by God. On the eighth day, they took the baby and presented him in the temple and literally circumcised him. And Simeon had been looking for something. I love this scripture about Simeon because it said he was full of the Holy Spirit and he came to church looking with expectation and filled with the Holy Ghost. Can I talk to you that the church ought not pump you up. The right. church ought to be a place where you have an overflow. Amen. Come on, you ought to come. Come on, sinners need to be pumped up, but believers ought to become full of the Holy Ghost. Listen, until you're full of the Holy Ghost, you won't be looking for nothing. Now, come on, Simeon was full of the Holy Ghost, and he was looking for the consolation of Israel. And he had a promise from God because he said to God, don't let me die till I see it. That, that's my cry. I've been hearing about glory and, and the glory cloud coming and God moving in the church and miracles happening and heathens coming to the Lord. I've heard so much prophecy. I'm up to here and I've heard it. I'm at the point where I don't want to hear it. I want to see it. Come on, there has to be an expectation 
inside of us that we're going to see it. Simeon, because he was full of the Holy Ghost, had an expectation. I would have asked you tonight as we close, what's the expectation you have because you're so full of the Holy Ghost? That, God, I'm not going to die till I see it. I'm not going to die till I see Jesus be who he said he was. I, I'm, I don't want to die until I see my husband totally committed to God. I, I'm not going to die until you bring me the man that's going to complete my life. I'm not going to die until my children are, are surrendered to God and all of them are serving God and filled with God's glory and power. I, I'm not going to die until I see an abundance of finances in my life where it's not just enough for me to pay my bills. There's an overflow. I'm not going to die until I see my enemies literally have an encounter with God and their hearts are changed. I, I'm not going to I'm not going to die until I forgive everyone that's offended me and everyone that abuses and mistreats me. I'm not going to die until I see the consolation of the salvation of God. I refuse to die and Simeon said I'm so full of the Holy Spirit every time I enter the temple I'm looking. God, come on I, I want you to know that part of the enemy that comes to you and I is to show up at a church service not expecting anything. Come on, come on. There, there was something I came in this morning expecting something. I, I'm here tonight expecting something. I, I don't want to live my life not expecting something. I'm expecting to see who Jesus said he was in the fullness of his glory. And Simeon was full of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wants to impregnate us with expectation. In the midst of it, Simeon lifts him up and begins to prophesy. I found out that when Jesus shows up in the house, it looses the spirit of prophecy. Can, can I talk to you tonight that everybody that's full of the Holy Ghost ought to be prophesying? You say, well, I don't feel lead. Well, get the lead out. <laughs> there ought to be an expectation that we open our mouth and declare who Jesus is. I was at a church service the other day and I had to get, I, 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 it took everything I had not to laugh. But a little five-year-old boy came up at the church service and he said, Sit the Brown. He had a little list problem. He said, Sit the Brown. He said, Can I pray for you before you preach? And I said, Oh, isn't that sweet? And so the pastor said, Before you say yes, you better know this boy is full of the Holy Ghost. And I thought, well, hallelujah. <laughs> well, he laid hands on me. I lacked revelation, but when he got through, I understood what revelation was because he grabbed his little hand, put it on my head and said, God, help Sister Brown. She needs help real bad because she doesn't know when to say something and when not to say something. <laughs> and I'm thinking, get your hands off of me. <laughs> And he was praying so loud that the first two rows behind me had stopped talking and was involved in my prayer. <laughs> in the middle of the service, when I began to preach on the righteous judgment of the Lord, and let me tell you, you won't believe in what is not preached. Come on, we're in a crisis right now. People believe in faith because we've preached it. People believe in being filled with the Holy Spirit because we've preached it. People believe in healing because we have preached it. People believe in prosperity and blessing because we have preached it. But we have not preached the judgment of the Lord that is fixing to come to the earth because we have not preached it. Come on, you won't believe in what's not being preached. And God is fixing to show up as righteous judge in the earth. And we need to aware the people. In the midst of preaching about the righteous judge coming and standing in his rightful place in the church, this five-year-old got up and started prophesying out of the book of Amos. <gasps> Opened his mouth out of the book of Amos and began to prophesy over that church and heaven fell down in the midst of that church, church members began to fall out of their pew and lay out on the floor. Not because what I preach, but the confirmation that when God is in the house, he can prophesy. Yes. Come on, he can make clear what, what the word is that's being preached. In the midst of it, Simeon began to open his mouth and prophesy. 
And listen, when he began to prophesy and finished, Anna, 84 years old, who had given herself to fasting and prayer, that was a widow, not a busybody. Oh, uh, come on but gave herself, come on, because when we become widows, can I talk to us tonight? When you become a widow, you don't have certain responsibilities. You ought to have more time to fast and pray. Gave herself to fasting and prayer and began to prophesy. Why? Because when God is in the house, it liberates men and women, and they don't compete, they complete. Come on, men and women. Not just women prophesying, not just men prophesying, but Simeon and Anna both opened their mouth and began to prophesy who was in the house, who was in the house, who was in the house, what was being revealed, what is the consolation of Israel, why has he come, why did he get marked by the Father, why did he have to be circumcised if he was deity, why did they mark him, because God had come to mark a people and separate them. Separation and marking ought to be evident if you are born again. 